All right. Oh, my goodness gracious. It's on 11. Why does it go up to 11? Why couldn't it just be 10? Let's make that the number. Oh, this one goes to 11. All right. <clears throat> it's Spinal Tap. Forget it. All right. Um, I want to read this to you purely out of my own vanity and just, just for the fun of it and because Alex is sitting right there and this has nothing to do with him and you'll see what I mean in just a second. So uh, let, me, let me just give you the background very quickly because we are here to learn, but you know I must be indulged. Um, I got an email about a week ago from a congregation of Christians in India uh, and they had a Bible question. I think they had just seen our website. I don't think they even knew. I don't think we haven't started the class yet. Um, but they just they just sent a, a, a message. They had a Bible question. So I responded to the Bible question with the Bible answer, as you should do. And then they replied back, thank you. And they had another question. And then it begins. So I responded with an answer. And they responded with a thank you and a question. And I responded with an answer. And it goes back and forth like this, which is fine. You know, it's just sharpening the sword, you know, keeping, it, keeping the iron hot and so forth in my brain. So that's great. But then I get this reply. And I just want to read this to you just because it's great. So this is about the fourth or fifth reply. They say to me, thank you for the kind reply. Your local congregation, that's you guys, so listen carefully, are, hush now, Lauren, she heard this already, are so blessed by God to have you as their wisdomful preacher. Now, they don't even know you exist, Alex. This has nothing to do with you. <laughs> this is all about me. That is, oh, they even say, wisdomful, that is you only. So maybe they did know you exist. We are witness to that. Let us ask another question, dot, dot, dot. So then I answer that question. And then finally, now here's the, the conclusion. After going back and forth several more days, I get this one. They say, thank you very much. If you are ever thinking about moving to India, we would love to utilize your teachings as the preacher of our local congregation for our numbers to increase, et cetera, et cetera. Shh. I'm not moving to India. But if I was, I have an offer on the table. So you guys better, you know appreciate me or I might just take the first ticket use that for a raise. yeah it's exactly right Charles said I should use that for a raise just to make sure we all heard that so. just give me some of Alex's salary he's not doing anything he's dead weight all right let's get to the serious stuff um Bible question time here is let's just dive right into it here is the first question to consider this evening and it is this is it right or wrong to be baptized more than once so let's understand, first of all, what baptism is, is and is not. Or let's just put it this way, just to cut to the chase. Baptism, though it is a word that we use all the time in a religious context, baptism is not necessarily a religious word. Or in fact, let's just drop the necessarily. Baptism is not a religious word. It is predominantly used religiously, but its origins are not necessarily to be met um, strictly religiously. Uh, the word baptism just means to immerse or to overwhelm. Now, I say that, and I've got my trusty Oxford English right here, uh, because I want to make, while I'm answering this, I want to reinforce, because I've made this point before, I want to reinforce a point that is very critical for our understanding about Bible study and things and things of that nature, and that is this. You don't find meaning in a dictionary. I've said that before, and I'll keep saying it until... Everybody believes me, but you don't find meaning in a dictionary. Someone says, what's that word mean? And then someone smart Alex says, look it up. Well, no, Mr. Smart Alec, you don't look it up. That's not how you find meaning. You find meaning in context. And I can't talk and do the alphabet, so hang on. B-A-L-M-N-O-P. All right. You find meaning in context. A dictionary gives you usage. A dictionary gives you how to take that word and use it in a variety of ways because almost every word we use that are, you know, a major word has multiple usages. How you mean when you use that word depends on what you say around that word. And I've used the illustration of he's cool. Well, does that mean he's cold or does that mean he's popular? He's cool, he needs a leather jacket. Does that mean he's cool or does that mean he's popular? Again, you don't know, you just need more context, right? So here is baptize as it is defined in a dictionary from 1949. So I'm sure you could add to this in the decades since, but here's what this says. Baptize. Number one, there's multiple definitions, to dip or immerse in water or to pour or sprinkle water upon. Now, those are two different things because you can be sprinkled with water and not be immersed. And in fact, you can't be immersed and be sprinkled at the same time. There are degrees of one or another. One becomes the other as you get deeper into the water. So those are two entirely different things, yet they're both listed under the definitions for baptize or baptism. So you can't say, well, what is the dictionary definition of baptize? And that's how I'll know. Well, the Bible is not the dictionary. Merriam-Webster is not the Holy Spirit. 
You have to figure out what the context is and how it is used. And the Bible uses baptize never to mean sprinkling and never to mean pouring. The Bible uses it in a context to mean to overwhelm. That was, as we use the phrase, the classical definition. Over the years, a different action was called baptize enough that enough people thought of it that way that it needed to be inserted into the dictionary as a potential usage of the word so that people can know what you mean when you use it in a sentence. Because if a Presbyterian says to you, I baptized my nephew, they don't mean immerse. They use, they use the word differently as the dictionary allows them to. If enough people thought baptism meant standing in a puddle of water whistling Dixie, the dictionary would add that into the, the list of possible meanings, and context would determine it. All right? But sprinkling is not there, pouring is not there, overwhelming is the classical usage as it is used in the Bible. But not necessarily overwhelming in water. A burial is a baptism. When you die, you are buried, and that is equated to baptism of a burial in water. But it's, it's predicated on you understanding that you're buried in dirt. First of all, you're baptized in dirt when you're physically dead. So you're baptized in water when you're spiritually or commandmentally baptized. So it, it, it could be a baptism in dirt. It could be a baptism in suffering. It could be a baptism in mayonnaise. As long as you're immersed, it's fine. It doesn't have to be religious. If it was religious, it'd be miracle whip. Not mayonnaise. So the Bible uses the word in a few different contexts. I got to laugh here, I got to laugh there, but I got nothing else, so we'll move on. Jesus talks about his death as a baptism in Matthew 20, verse 22. He meant there not water, but an overwhelming of suffering, and context bears out the meaning. Paul, I love this one. Paul in 1 Corinthians 10 talks about the Red Sea crossing, and he calls it the baptism of Moses. And I have an article I'm going to write on the website in a few weeks called The Baptism Where Nobody Got Wet. Because that's the great thing about the Red Sea crossing. You didn't touch the Red Sea. Everybody else, the Egyptians all touched the Red Sea. But they weren't baptized. The people who followed Moses didn't touch the Red Sea. They didn't get a drop on them, but they were baptized, according to 1 Corinthians 10. Why? Because baptism does not necessarily mean covered in water. It just means covered. And the people were covered. As I've illustrated before when I taught Corinthians, the people had... Let's pretend that's fire, because this is the only marker I have that has color to it right now. They had fire behind them, the wall of God protecting them from the Egyptians wanting to advance. They had dry ground below them, where should have been water flooding them. God provided that for them. They had a wall of water on either side of them that should have been crushing and drowning them, but was lifted up, raised up by the power of God through Moses. Again, God did that for them. They had a cloud in front of them, or a cloud above them, guiding them to what was ahead of them, which was the promised land, proverbially speaking. They had a ways to go to get there. In other words, if I'm standing right here on that R, and I'm crossing the Red Sea, no matter which way I look, I have a blessing, a praise to give to God for the dry ground, for the wall of water, for the fire behind me, for the cloud ahead of me, or for the promised land in front of me. I am completely surrounded by what Moses, through God, has provided for me, the baptism of Moses. That makes sense? That's how the word is used in that context. But traditionally, typically, it is meant to be an immersion in water. Most famously, as your go-to understanding, is John 3, 23. John was baptizing near Salem in the Jordan because there was much water there. You don't need much water to sprinkle or to pour or to, I mean, and there's not even mayonnaise in Salem. So it's, it's water, and it was much water. And water is typically the way we use it today. In fact, you can trace a, an etymological lineage as to what kind of baptism to use, starting right there. John the baptizer's baptism was a baptism in water, an immersion, a dipping in water. Which is why the Renaissance paintings are so ridiculous that always depict John with Jesus, and they always look like a couple of white dudes, standing waist deep in the water, and he's pouring water on him. Like, why are we even in the water right now if you're just going to pour water on him? What a waste of a towel. Just do it outside, deck a cup, and splash him. But no, it was an immersion. That's the way John baptized. That same kind of baptism was done by Jesus' disciples in his name, following the tradition of John and the way he did that baptism. And then when Jesus gave the great commission and he sent his disciples out, he told them to go and baptize, a word that they have now associated, used, so they know the meaning of, associated with an immersion based on the way John did it and the way Jesus did it during his ministry. Jesus' disciples did it during his ministry. So when he said go baptize, they had the context they knew to immerse. So when Peter fulfills that commandment to 
tell them to be baptized on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, you don't have to wonder, is that a sprinkling or a pouring? Because he was told in the Great Commission to, by context, immerse. And so every baptism through the book of Acts is going to follow that template, therefore it is an immersion. So when we command someone to be baptized and we give them Acts, the book, as their guidance, you don't have to question what kind of baptism. The Bible defines it and gives you the meaning and the usage. Okay? This is all background. I'm building to the answer of the question, but still. Now, the New Testament commands people who want to be Christians must be immersed, and according to context, must be immersed in water. Mark 16, 16, Acts 22, 16, 1 Peter 3, 21, etc. There is nothing magical about water, or that water, or any water, or baptism, or baptismal waters, or baptismal garments that sometimes people wear with gold trim, or anything like that. There's nothing magical about anything that has to do with it. You are not saved by water. You were saved by Jesus' blood, all right? Water is simply the commandment that he gave you to be immersed in it in order for him to save you with that blood, for you to access that blood. And you can rationalize it, and you can justify it, and you can make sense of it, and Paul provides you how to do that in Romans 6. It's a reenactment of a death, burial, resurrection. You go into the watery grave so that none of us have to go into an actual physical grave to reenact it that way. It's more convenient. It's easier. It's, you know, able to be spread through an evangelistic message worldwide. Okay, fine, I can rationalize it all those ways. But at the end of the day, it's not the water that's saving me. It is God who is saving me when I obey God. He could have commanded anything, but this is what he commanded. All right. Now, anybody who tries to tell you, well, it doesn't matter what you're baptized for or how you're baptized or why you're baptized. As long as you are baptized, then you're fine. You fulfill the command if you think it's a command. This is what they'll say. But all you're doing when you tell me that is, all you're telling me is you believe in works salvation. Because you're telling me as long as you get dunked, you're saved. You're saying that dunking is what saves me. And it's not. It's God. Therefore, it is God and God's terms and God's requirements that I need to adhere to. All right? Now, to illustrate that, let me illustrate that. When Jericho fell in Joshua 6, as you know, there was one resident of the city who was spared. Who was that? Rahab the harlot. Why was she spared? Because she hanged, what, what did she hang out of her window? The scarlet cord, yes, the scarlet ribbon, the red cord, however your Bible translates it. So is she saved by the red cord? Did, is that what saved her? Well, what do you mean? Because she was commanded to, so in so doing, that's what saved her. Yes, right, she was saved by God. But the red cord wasn't magical. The scarlet thread was not magical. If it was, let me posit a, a scenario for you. Let's say it two towns over, she hangs that red cord, someone looks out and sees... Apparently, we're hanging red cords today. I don't know why, but I guess I'll hang mine too because I don't want to be the neighbor that's left out. So some rando person from Jericho gets some red thread and hangs it out their window for no reason whatsoever. They have no respect for God like Rahab did. They have no consideration for the judgment that is coming like Rahab did. No desire to obey God because this person doesn't even know to obey. They just saw and decided to mimic it. Now Jericho falls. Is that person's house going to stand? No. And if you say yes, it's because you believe in red thread salvation. But I don't believe in red thread salvation. I believe in God's salvation. God saved. And God saved Rahab because Rahab faithfully obeyed whatever the commandment for her was. You cannot just randomly look into doing what God told you to do and fall backwards into salvation. There's no Bible principle to teach that idea. Okay? All right. Uh, repentance of sins is a commandment that one must adhere to in order to be saved of God. You're commanded to repent. It is a prerequ prerequisite to your salvation. So what happens, following the scarlet thread metaphor, what happens when a person does not repent of their sins? They show no remorse. They show no desire to change. They have no even contemplation of that notion. And they get dunked in water. Is that person saved? You would not believe how many people will say, well, yeah, they got baptized. You're preaching water salvation when you say that. Because water does not save. And someone will come back with, well, baptism saves, 1 Peter 3, 21. Peter wrote that with the understanding and the context of a faithfully obedient person, okay? Not about getting dunked in water in general. Not about the guy who slips in his bathtub and happens to be immersed. Not about the guy who dives off the cliff at summer camp and gets dunked in water. That's not what he's talking about. So it is your faith in Jesus Christ which compels you to change your life mentally with repentance and then in action through confession and baptism that compels God because he set those terms to wash your sins away. And it happens when you're baptized. But you're saved not through your works that you do, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, but through your faithful obedience with the blood of Christ. All right? Now, I say all that 
to say this. Sometimes a person is baptized. A year, two years, 10 years, 20 years passes. And they look back on that occasion and they think, did I do it for the right reason? Did I know what I was doing? If you've already forgotten the question because I've rambled so much, the question was, is it right or wrong to be baptized again? Assuming the person means baptized for the remission of sins again. They look back on when they were baptized and they think, was it just because my parents wanted me to do it? Was it just because all my friends were doing it? We run into this all the time at summer camp. Alex remembers being at summer camp. You know, two or three kids get baptized. Suddenly all their friends want to be baptized. And it's, it's a challenge for a counselor or for a preacher to make sure, are you doing this because you want to do it or because your friend Susie just got dunked in the water and everyone's rushing to hug her and you're a teenager and so you're overcome with emotions anyway and so forth. So they look back and they think, was it just pressure? Was it just, you know, adherence to parental doctrine or was it my faith that compelled me to do it? And they doubt and they wonder and they go to the preacher or whomever and they say, I think I need to be rebaptized. Is there anything wrong with that? No. No. How can there be? Because all you're doing is you're telling me you're an honest heart who's seeking to make their calling and election sure, to quote from the old King James. It's a person who simply is trying to be right, and they're worried. Now, we should not live in worry, okay? What do you do then if you baptize that person? And six months later again, they come to you and say, well, now I wonder. Now it's time, I think, for, for counseling. Now it's time, I think, for a sit-down and a Bible study to see what's at the root of this that's causing this person to constantly doubt. But if there's this big gap, and suddenly they wonder, and they want to get re-immersed, they want to get re-dipped, to be blunt, they want to get redunked. Well, then what is, that going to, what is that harming? Because now, clearly based on what they've said, now they understand the gospel and they understand what they're doing. So either they understood it the first time and all this is it's a cow's opinion. It's all just a moot point. Or they didn't understand it and now they do. And so now they're saved. Either way, they're coming up out of the water. That time or this time, washed in the sight of God. So what does it matter in that case? I think sometimes we, we worry we, we put the pressure on ourselves before we baptize somebody. Does this person know enough? Is this person you know, right? Am I going to be punished? Am I going to be condemned if I put this person in the water for, for no reason whatsoever? You know, or, you know, that's an exaggeration, but I, 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 I hope this person is doing this for the right reason, but I don't know. What if they're not? Am I going to be held accountable? That kind of thing. We put that pressure on ourselves, and it causes us to doubt someone else's salvation. That's a dangerous road to get on because we don't know people's hearts. But as long as we understand the principle that water doesn't save you and you're saved by faithful obedience, do you believe Jesus Christ? Then be baptized to reenact his death, burial, and resurrection. And when you do, Jesus will save you. That's Mark 16, 16. That, that's, Repent of your sins and be immersed. That's Acts 2, 38. There, there is not this big, long litmus test sheet of you know, standardized questions that you have to answer, fill in the bubble, never answer C. It's not like that. That being said, someone is going to ask, well, what does a person need to know? Does a person need to know anything beyond just the sheer fact of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection? I think your Bible gives you a very clear template to answer this question. Open your Bibles to Acts 8, verse 12. It's just one verse, but I want you all to see it. So everybody open your Bibles to Acts 8, verse 12. And this is to answer kind of an offshoot question someone will have. Because I think the obvious answer to the first one is no. There's nothing wrong with getting rebaptized just in and of itself. All right? Because one of them is going to stick if you're doing it for the right reason. But still someone will say, well, then along that line, what does a person need to know? What would be your criteria? If someone comes to you, Matthew Martin, as the preacher, and they say, I want to be baptized, what do you say to them? What's your, you know, litmus test, for lack of a better? And so here's what I would go to. Look at Acts 8, 12. When they, the Samaritans, being preached to, when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. You need to understand two principal things in order for your baptism to take, okay? You need to know what you're getting out of, and you need to know what you're getting into. What you're getting out of is the world through a reenacting of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Through his authority, his name, the name of Jesus, you, by submitting to him, are leaving the world behind to follow him. No longer following the devil, but now you're following Christ. You need to understand that, first of all. What you're getting out of is the world. You also need to understand what you're getting into, because they also believed, Philip, concerning the kingdom of Jesus Christ. You're getting into a spiritual body. You're entering into the home of the saved. This answers, in part, the question we had last week, if you remember. Someone asked, can I constantly flip-flop back and forth between um, Christianity and my old religion that I left? Well, no, you can't do that. I mean, you could do whatever you want, but you can't be scriptural and do that. Because you have 
supposedly by your repentance and your submission to Christ, yielded over your allegiance to any other religious body, to any other doctrine or, or, or uh, philosophy of man that may try to hold sway over you. You yielded to Christ. You're getting into a spiritual body, his kingdom. So if a person understands that through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, you're teaching that to them, through that and through the authority vested in that, he will save them out of the world and put them into his body then that person who comes to you and says, I believe that, I want that, I have sinned and I want to have it washed away, what is stopping you from putting that person in the one? Right? Obviously, with everything, there's always a what if, this random scenario. Well, you can't answer every scenario, but that generalizes the idea. I have one more supplemental question that may be on someone's mind. Someone may hear all that and they say, well, can a person be baptized religiously for the wrong reason? Not just, I got dunked in water, does that count? Okay, I think we can all agree, you're not saved by water, you're not saved by works, so that shouldn't count. But if a person says, okay, I I hear you preaching the gospel, and I believe in Jesus Christ, and I was baptized in my home church like 20 years ago. They, They voted on me, and I was dunked in water, and they all agreed that I could join their church. So I've been dunked in a religious setting, there was a steeple over the door, so that means it's good, right? No, it does not. It does not mean that at all. And I'll tell you a simple logical conclusion to draw from and then i'm going to move on but i'm going to come back to this in a bigger question in a couple of weeks someone asked about acts 19 and the rebaptism of those disciples so if you have a question i'll probably answer it then but just to answer it here because it's relevant listen to these three simple points okay listen to this salvation requires obedience and i can give you scripture if you don't believe me obedience requires knowledge that's just common sense and knowledge requires truth okay Now, if you are lied to, if you don't know the truth, then what you obey is not truth but a lie. And you will not be saved by a lie. You're saved by the truth. The truth shall set you free, Jesus says. So salvation requires knowledge. Knowledge requires obedience, and obedience requires truth. Therefore, you need to have the truth for you to obey that truth and be saved, set free by his truth. So if you did not have the right knowledge because you were lied to, as some people are in religious circles, and you obeyed a lie, then I'm sorry, you just got wet, you might as well have just jumped off the cliff at summer camp and got dunked in water, because water doesn't save you. Jesus' blood saves you when you know and you obey his command. All right. So no, there's nothing wrong in and of itself of being rebaptized. The real tragedy would be someone who knows what to do and doesn't get baptized at all. All right, go ahead and pull up the thing on the screen, please. This was a question that was asked. It came with show and tell. All right. I don't know if you can read that, but I'm going to read it to you. The question is simply this, what's up with this? All right, now to summarize that question, how you can summarize that, to elongate that question, is Jesus just simply an amalgamation of various pagan gods? You may have seen something like this. Go ahead and hit the next slide. I cut it in pieces to make it easier to see. Hit the next slide, please. Um, It takes these two and it reaches a conclusion. Hit the over button. Well, okay, that's all right. If it gets to it, it'll get to it. You'll see it in a second. But it basically, it summarizes it by saying, see, Jesus is just an amalgamation. The story of Jesus is just a summary of the, there it is, the virgin birth to the resurrection, the story of Jesus Christ is just a retelling of the stories of gods that predated him by hundreds of years. All right, now go back. Now that you've seen that, this is what it, it posits to you. You see this big image of these two big gods, and you see laid out for you these facts and figures and things that you as a person who's familiar with the story of Jesus, even tangentially familiar, okay? You can read this and you can think, oh yeah, this is Jesus, this is Jesus. <gasps> but this is about this God, and this is about this God? Oh no, my whole real world is crumbling. So let's answer it. Was Jesus taken from the Egyptian God Horus? Horus, it says, was born on December 25th. No, Horus' birthday is celebrated around October, November. Horus was born of a virgin. No, actually. Horus was born by Isis, who was the widow of Osiris. Osiris actually got busy with the dead body um, to get her pregnant, but that's a long story. Let's not bother with that. Egyptian mythology is really whack. But anyway, no, not born of a virgin. Three wise men came following a star to adore the newborn Savior. There is nothing in Egyptian mythology that has anything to do with that whatsoever. And the New Testament doesn't even say three wise men. That is just whoever wrote this assumes that because they're familiar with the, the song you know, we three kings of Orient are, and so they assumed there were three, when all the Bible says is, magi, wise men from the east, brought three gifts. There could have been two or 200, for all we know. We just know they brought three gifts. We don't know how many. What this shows you is, when they say things like that, 
is they are not actually deriving this from historical document, the Bible included. They're simply taking the assumptions that they have about the Bible and contorting it and twisting it to try to convince you of things that are not biblical. Uh, Horace was a child prodigy teacher at the age of 12. Of course, Jesus was that, John 2. But there's nothing to this. Horace was a god. And there's nothing even in Egyptian god environment where he could have been a child prodigy or a child at all. Horus had 12 disciples. No, some say 4, some say 16, some say infinite, uh, but none say 12. Horus was transfigured on the mount. Look at what it says. It's um, one, one, two, three, fourth paragraph at the very last line. Transfigured on the mount. What mount? Which mount? Mount of Olives? In Egypt they're saying this? Which mount? An Egyptian mount? You think they would label it? There is no mount. You see, they just, they're intentionally vague with that phraseology, knowing that you know about the transfiguration on the mount of transfiguration. That you know about it, and they're letting you fill in the blanks in your mind to sow in your own mind your own seeds of doubt. They're, you're doing the work for them there. Look at, see what they say, and see how vague they're being deliberately to mislead. He, Horus, baptized people and taught at the age of 30. No, there is nothing in Egyptian mythology, even about that at all. Egyptian gods were just statues, they were paintings, they were you know, engravings, they were you know, headpieces they wore on their funny hats, but they were not... They were not active in that sense that's just not how they worked and operated the other one was he taken from the zoroastrian god zoroastrian is an iranian um, era iranian regional god very old religion zoroastrianism a mithras mithras was born of a virgin no popped out of a rock mithras was born december 25 no there is no date attached to mithras's birth in fact why would it even be december 25 number one jesus was not born on december 25 and number two mithras predates the julian calendar there was no december and there was no 25 okay mithras had 12 disciples well no he's among other things the god of the zodiac so sure you got 12 but i mean that's just a number mithras was crucified dead for three days and resurrected there's nothing in Zoroastrian mythology, to, to give you that, there's nothing about that at all. So it, it says something about these people who made this, and it says something about Christianity, that they're desperate, and they have no facts, and Christianity is so rock solid, you can't even use its own religion against it. You have to make up things about it and apply misconceptions to try to take it down. So your question was, what's up with that? Not a whole lot would be the answer. I do have two more gods, but I don't have slides for them. You can go ahead and turn it off if you guys want back there. Two more gods, and that is the god um, Addis, who is a Greek and Phrygian god. You might see this one pop up. And another one is Krishna, the Hindu god. Addis was born of a virgin, they'll say. No, nope, plucked out of an almond tree. Born on December 25. No, again, 1200 B.C. or so. The Julian calendar is like 700 or so, or 70 or so. No, um, 70, not 700. So, no, you're way off. The, the Julian calendar doesn't even fit. They would certainly not say December 25. Addis was crucified. Crucified? Half a century before the Persians invented it? No. Addis was dead for three days and resurrected. No, he's the god of vegetation. So he dies every winter and rises in the spring, I guess, but that's not three days. And here's the other one. Krishna. Hari Hari Krishna. You've heard the song, um, George Harrison. Krishna was born of a virgin named Devaki. So it's like Mary. That's like her middle name, I guess. No, her uncle was her daddy, and her mom had half a dozen kids before her. Certainly not a virgin. Krishna was born with an eastern star shining brightly. There is nothing in that mythology or religion to corroborate that. Pure fabrication. Krishna was crucified, dead for three days, and resurrected. No, she was shot in the foot. What a way to go. And that's it. There's just nothing absolute to it. I wish there was something that I could dig into, but no, it's just a bunch of made-up stuff. That's, that's all there is to that. Okay? All right. Next question. Does God still curse people directly? like he did in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, God sent curses unto disobedient people, death, sickness, etc. Does he still do that today? Well, a year ago, I would have said no. But now I'm not so sure. Uh, listen, people might hear this question, and you might think, oh, who out there really thinks God is smiting them? Who out there really thinks God is chucking thunderbolts? But let's, let's just take this question and get to the core of it and just look at it from a different perspective, Okay. Have you ever had a really bad day, a really bad week, a really bad year, and change? And thought to yourself, why is this happening to me? Okay? What you are saying when you ask that rhetorical though it is question, is you are conceding in your mind the idea that you have done something, or in this case probably you haven't done something, to justify this being done to you. 
So somebody who is a higher power, if you're a Christian, then you believe it's God, is doing this to you. So you may not phrase it like, does God still smite people with leprosy or whatever? But if you phrase it that way, a lot of people make that statement. Uh, what did I do to deserve this? Well, who says this is being done at all? Deserves got nothing to do with it, to quote Unforgiven. So, yes, it is true that in the Bible times, uh, God did smite people. Numerous examples of that. They're not even worth uh, citing because you know them. Um, Job. Well, I'll cite them because I wrote it down. Job was, was suffered repeatedly, all right? But the thing of it was, Job thought God was doing it. The presumption was God was doing it. Well, that presumption came from somewhere, okay? God has smited people, smote people before. Job simply thought God was doing it. But the lesson you learn from Job is, no, the, de pardon me, the devil was doing it because Job had not done anything wrong. Because Job was, let's phrase this badly, unworthy of a smiting, okay? All have sinned, but still, let's say it that way. Because he was so unworthy, that's why the devil targeted him. That's why the devil picked on him. Because he was so pure and good and righteous and faithful. So that's the lesson of the book of Job, you know, to summarize Alex's entire class, is the more faithful you are, the more target you paint on your back for the devil to attack you, but the more faithful you are in spite of that, the more you'll be blessed in the end when it's all said and done, all right? Job thought, his friends thought, his wife thought that he had done something wrong. Job was the only one who knew he was innocent, just doesn't understand why kept, God kept doing this to him until he finds out God wasn't. So the lesson is, yes, God does smite, but he doesn't always. Sometimes the devil does the work. In John 9, in the New Testament, Jesus and the apostles come across this beautiful chapter, a man who was born blind. And the disciples ask a very interesting question. They say two parts. Lord, who sinned to cause this man to be blind right now before us? Was it him or his parents? And I don't know how you can work it out that a guy who was born blind did something wrong to deserve it. I don't know how he pulled that off, the guy. But I can concede the possibility of parents doing something wrong and being punished with a, with a child being born blind. Though that kind of flies in the face of everyone who sins will be punished, not your children, Ezekiel, but whatever. So you can at least see the logic behind the question. Jesus' answer is simply, nobody sinned, but let me use this to show you the power of God that I have. Nobody sinned, in other words. Sometimes things just happen. I'm going to give you one of my favorite pet phrases. Are you ready? Sometimes your dog just dies. That's it. There isn't always a grand explanation. We tend to want one, a little bit of it is vanity and pride. We assume my dog died. There must be some grand explanation. Why is this happening to me? What did I do to deserve this? Well, you ran over with your car. That's why I died. Because you were late for work, because you overslept, because your dog was barking all night. So justice. So we, we say those things, and we don't understand what we're really saying when I, we're attributing to God that which is just natural circumstance. When a tornado levels a city, God is not just doing this, you know, like with a straw in a cup. He's not causing the tornado. God created nature and allows it to take its course. So God operates in three ways. God operates naturally, a tornado. That's the working of God by his creation and letting it go. He operates supernaturally. God interjects himself into an environment. If a tornado appears in this building, in this room, that's a miracle. That's supernatural. That's God doing something. Then you can say God did that. And then God works extra naturally. If I pray for rain and it rains, it may have rained anyway. It may wasn't going to rain maybe. And then I prayed and it did. That's still a natural occurrence, but God answered the prayer to allow it to happen. So there's a lot of things you can attribute to God. Sometimes something bad does happen. Sometimes your dog just dies. Sometimes it is the devil smiting you, as we learn in Job. Or the dog just dies could be the man born blind. And sometimes, sometimes you are wicked. Sometimes you do need to be punished. And sometimes God doesn't wait until Judgment Day. And be thankful for that because there's no take-backs after that. There's no, I'm sorry, I learned my lessons after Judgment Day. So would you rather be spanked now and get the chance for the hug after or get the grand final spanking at Judgment Day where there is no hug after? It's just a part for me I never knew you. I'd rather have the punishment now so I can learn my lesson. Let me give you Hebrews 12, verses 5 through 8. Again, as, yeah, if you want to turn there while you're turning there, I'm not saying every time something bad happens, God is chucking the thunderbolt like Zeus was thought to have done. I'm just saying sometimes. If we can sometimes attribute it to nature and sometimes attribute it to the devil, why not sometimes attribute it to God? Because this is God's modus operandi, Hebrews 12, verse 5. You have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you like you were children. Quote, my son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when you rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. 
If you endure that chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father does not chasten? What kind of son would you be if your father did not spank you when you were bad? You would be without chastisement, of which we're all partakers. You would be illegitimate children. But you're not illegitimate, you're legitimate. And mind you, that text is written to a people undergoing persecution by the devil and his minions. But Paul uses it as an opportunity to remind them not to blame God for this, but to lean closer to God and treat this as though this is just discipline making you stronger, more adept, and more capable to get through the next trial, next trial the next crisis that comes over the, 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 the bend. So he's just using that as the application to teach the lesson that sometimes God does chasten, sometimes God does scourge, spank, in a modern context. And if he didn't, well, you wouldn't be much of a son in his eyes, and he wouldn't be much of a father in yours. All right, that's about all I can say in terms of answering that question. Does he still punish people today? I don't know. I, I can't identify it when it happens. But you can make a logical case for it being possible, happening sometimes. I'll just say this, though. Here's another one of my phrases, and this one's not sarcastic. Whenever you have trouble, whenever bad things happen, you can blame God, and you don't even know if he's causing it. You can blame Satan, and he may be causing it. Or you can just forget about casting blame at all and just run to God. And if the devil is doing it, well, you're running to God, not the devil, and the devil tends to flee from you when that happens. And if God did do it, it's because you need to learn a lesson, and look, you're running to God, lesson learned. So either way, you're going to come out of it better. All right? All right. Next question. Multiple people, this will be our last one because it's a big one. Multiple people have asked this. I'm going to read the biggest version of the questions that were asked. Go ahead and open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 11 while I read the question. It is this. Men remove their caps before praying or do not even wear a cap or hat during worship at all. So why do women not wear a head covering? Is it a sin for a woman to have short hair or a shaved head? You might think that's a non sequitur, but they are related as we'll see in the text. All right. So there's your question. It's the head covering question. So let's go to 1 Corinthians 11. I'm going to just break down some of these core verses that really hammer this explanation home. Look at verse 2 of 1 Corinthians 11. Paul says, Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the, King James says, ordinances as I deliver them to you. Ordinances, the word means traditional law or the law of your traditions. He says that as an introduction to what he's going to teach in this chapter. Brethren, I exhort you that you be mindful of the traditions of the culture around you. That's verse 1, all right? Verse, or that's verse 2. Verse 3, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of every woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Corinthian women, Christian women in this context, were wanting to rebel against the custom of the day, the culture of Corinth, which was that when you were in a worship setting, and it's Christian or pagan alike, either one, when you're in a reverential setting, all right, so I, and it could be a scenario where it's not religious at all, but it's reverential, then it is customary in Corinth for the man to have his head uncovered and for the woman to have her head covered. That was the culture. And what Paul does in verse 3 is he gives them a biblical principle to help them in following that cultural um, tradition for lack of a better and he what he says is the head of every man is christ men are not free to do what they please men must submit to christ the head of every woman is the man women are not free to do what they please they must submit to the husband and the head of christ is god christ was not free to do whatever he wanted he yielded to the father in other words he establishes this this idea of you must fit into the role that you are found in and you must adhere to it as is traditional or as is with respect to the commands of god that's just a principle he's going to apply here Verse 4, every man praying or prophesying with his head covered dishonors his head. Notice he starts with the man, not with the woman. It's funny thing about this, about Paul. Paul is routinely attacked as being a misogynist, routinely attacked as being a hater of women, a discriminator of women, putting downer of women. But he almost always, unless there's a specific thing where it just it simply can't be done, he almost always finds a gender equality argument. And so he starts by saying, let's be mindful, men, that we have to submit that we have a role to fall into. And anyone who doesn't follow that rule, men, is disobedient and dishonorable. A man who prays or prophesied with his head covered dishonors his head in Corinth. Because that's the tradition, that's the culture of Corinth. And I'll prove to you why it's that specifically in a minute. Verse 5. Now let's talk about the women. We started with the men. Move on to the ladies. Verse 5. And every woman that prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. See, it's the exact same consequence 
for a slightly different disobedience. But it, the point is the same depending on the gender, regardless of the gender. A man who disobeys the culture dishonors his head. A woman who disobeys the culture dishonors her head. We're on equal ground here. If you do that, ladies, in this culture, then you might as well have your head shaved. What does that matter? Who cares what length my hair is, Paul? Well, in the culture of Corinth, prostitutes kept their heads shaved. Not slick bold like me, but like no locks. They kept it cut short. That was, their, that was one of the outward signs to show that they were a prostitute. Mind you, that's just this culture. You go over to another country, and the, the culture could be long hair signals prostitution or some kind of a you know, particular kind of clothing, color, or so, or so forth. It's just the culture here was shaved head equals prostitute. So what Paul is doing with that is he's saying, if ladies, if you don't want to wear the veil, and that's what we're talking about here, that's the head covering, if you don't want to wear the veil, if you just choose not to adhere to that culture, you might as well go full bore, you might as well shave your head and be completely dishonorable. You might as well completely show yourself to be a harlot because you're acting like a dishonorable woman here and you're acting like one, then you might as well act like one over there. Okay, that takes us to our key word of the hour. If you can find me the word hat in this Bible, or your Bible, any Bible, I mean, oh, I shouldn't say any Bible. There's probably some crazy modern Bible that says hat, but those people didn't read the Bible when they translated it in those modern Bibles. But if you can find me the word hat, certainly in the original text, I'll buy you a Coke and I'll even make it a Dr. Pepper. You can't do it, it's not there, okay? What you have is the word katakalupto, which means a covering, or the man must be uncovered, uh, akatakalupto. Ah, you put the A in front of it, you negate it. Akatakalupto and katakalupto. The covering or an uncovering. All right? But hey, we don't find meaning in a dictionary. We find it in usage. And how is it used in the culture of Corinth? The ladies would wear a veil that was like on their shoulders and went up and it came to about their hairline and it covered their head. It wasn't like the full Muslim thing. We can only see like the ninja eyes. It wasn't like that. It just went up to about here and it stopped. That was the veil. You don't have, you don't have what the modern interpretation of that is, where you see some women wearing these big blue sombreros with the tassels and the big giant feather boa sticking out of it and all those kind of things, those big glamorous things. You don't find that. And so it's, it's always struck me as funny why it's okay to take this word that just means a veil covering, just a simple cloth covering, an Im, a, a modest covering, okay? Not showy, that would be immodest, just a modest veil. Why it's okay in some circles to take that and apply it to the sombrero, that some ladies wear and no one can see down in front. We've all sat in front of them. We, we, we've sat in front of them in some congregations, right? And we, you're doing this, you know, because she wants to wear what she thinks is the head covering. So she wears the big thing. Why would, that's okay to make it that, but not go in the other direction and insist on a burqa, you know, with just a little slit. It's just two extremes of the same word that's irrelevant to both con conclusions. That's the idea. All right, keep going. Look at verse number six. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. Paul is a sarcastic writer. It's my only permission for being such a sarcastic preacher because much of Paul's writing is very sarcastic, and that's what that is here. What he's saying is a callback to the previous verse, which is, you don't want to be covered? Then please, by all means, cut your hair and go ahead and look completely like a prostitute. Be a completely dishonorable woman because it is a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, so also let her be. Therefore, you shouldn't want that. You should be covered. Verse 5. If a man indeed, look how we're being gender equal here. If a man indeed not cover his head, for as much as he is the image of the glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man, he's also dishonorable. I have five minutes. Verse 13. Now look at this. Look how my verse 13 starts. Yours might be worded a little differently, but mine says, judge in yourselves. You people judge. Is that what yours says? You don't get to say that even if you're Paul, even if you're an authoritative ambassador of Jesus Christ, which is what an apostle was. You don't get to say, you decide, if it's a law. If it's a universal commandment for all times and generations and places and cultures, you don't get to say, ah, you people figure it out. No, if it's law, it's law, you say it is law. But if it's culture, and knowing that his letter is going to be read by different cultures, Paul has to hedge his bets. So he has to say, you decide. Based on your culture, is it comely that a woman pray to God uncovered? Well, is it? In this culture, it was not. It was not appropriate. And so she must be covered. Is it in our culture to make our application right now? We just said a prayer a minute ago. Margaret, did you put a doily on your head? I've seen the doily to go the other extreme. Instead of the sombrero, it's just a little doily. Did you cover your head? No, she did not. But the last time you sneezed, we don't need to know. We don't need to get personal. But the last time you sneezed, did you say, excuse me? I would hope so, Margaret. My goodness. All right. Look at verse number 14. 
surely you did. And the whole world is watching, Margaret. Yeah, Margaret, she says excuse me when she sneezes. She's not a savage, okay? All right, oops. <clears throat> All right, does not even nature itself teach you? It's how my verse starts in verse 14. Is that what yours says? Mine says nature. Does your Bible say nature? Who has a different word in verse 14? Does everyone say nature? All right, great. But what does this word mean? What's the usage? What's the context of the word? What is nature? This word, phusis, is the word nature, and it means a long-standing, slowly developed thing. All right? In the context, it is how we would use the term... I don't know why I'm writing this, because it's sideways anyway. Second nature, all right? If Margaret had never been taught by probably her mother or someone like that when she was a young child, if she had never been taught, we say, excuse me, when you sneeze. If she had never been taught that and we just kept her in a bubble her whole life, then we wheel her out and she sneezes. Is she going to say, excuse me? No. But when a dog sees another dog, is that dog going to bark? Yes. That's, that's its first nature. But Margaret's saying, excuse me, that's second nature. We have to learn that. All right? It is slowly developed and learned over time. It's culture. All right? But why does a man hold the door open for a lady? Well, he doesn't anymore. But 50 years ago, we did because it was culture. And Charles still does because he grew up in that culture. Right? All right. That's second nature. And that's the word he uses here about head coverings. This is something you've learned and developed. And so the point he's making here is Christians must adhere to it, not because it's a universal law, but because it's your circumstantial culture. All right? Verse 15. If a woman has long hair, that's a glory to her. This is the justification for the culture. For her hair is given to her as a covering. But flip the gender. Verse 16, if a man, if any man seems to be contentious, we have, look at this, we have no such custom. In other words, the churches of Christ, Christianity, the universal kingdom, has no custom regarding head covering. It has no law about saying, excuse me, when you sneeze. There is no commandment about holding the door open for your wife. If there was, we would all be having to do it. And Charles is the only one who does right? So it is, it is your custom, it is your culture, and the churches of Christ do not have such. We are integrated into a different culture, the world's culture, wherever we may find ourselves, and as long as we're not breaking the commandments of Christ, adhere to the culture around you. If you go to some, you know, third world, I hate to get um, stereotypical, some third world living in huts country, and they have some custom where it's, it's shameful to wear blue. There's no commandment for wearing blue, so don't wear blue. Oh, but there's no commandment against it. Yes, there is. Their culture. That's the commandment. Adhere to their commandment because it doesn't disobey Christ. Now, if their culture is all women are topless, and there are some like that, well, by all means, do not adhere to that cultural, a cultural uh, stereotype because, and it is a stereotype, I should say, because your Bible does teach you modesty, and that is a commandment, okay? So use your common sense, use your brain, and know the difference. But to answer this one, why, why don't people uh, today wear head coverings or not, depending on gender? It's because our culture does not designate that they should one way or another, okay? I know a church, a congregation in Memphis. I worshiped there. I was the associate minister there. They oversee the school of preaching where I graduated. They, uh, they insist that men wear a jacket when they say a prayer. Now, you have to wear a shirt and tie, too, but you, know, you have also have to wear a coat, sport coat at least, if not a suit, when you say a prayer. They say, you're leading in worship, dress as respectable as possible, we'll define the terms, be respectable. Well, I, you know, I don't, but I'll go there and I'll adhere. We're going to be there in a couple of weeks. I'm going to wear my blazer, I'm going to wear my sports coat, or whatever I'm going to wear. And if they ask me to lead a prayer, which they won't, then, you know, I'll make sure I'm wearing my coat so that they don't feel offended because that's their culture. There's no commandment not to, so I'll adhere to their culture, lest I be disagreeable. That's the principle of 1 Corinthians 8, which he's making the application to in chapter 11. All right, that's all the questions and answers time I have for you. Obviously, I have so much more, but I'm just, I talk too long. Next week, some of the questions, why did God put the tree in the garden? Isn't he just tempting them? We talked about that one last week. We'll answer it. Um, if God knows our decisions, do we really have free will? Can't wait to get to that one. Um, one more. Do people in the Old Testament have the gift of the Holy Spirit? How many wives did Moses have? Some of the questions we have coming up. So stay tuned. We'll see you next week. That's all I have. Thanks very much.